Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Rose and Rubini podcast, Making Sense of This World. My name is Manas Chavla, and as always, I have the pleasure of being joined by CEO and Head of Research, Brunella Rosa. This week, uh, we're discussing how the world is entering the era of chaos, when no country uh, has singular global leadership. Uh, this is also the week where Chinese President Xi Jinping returns to Europe after uh, five years uh making a sort of very important trip to, you know, Serbia, Hungary, France, amongst other countries. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk, Brunello, about the rise of China threatening American dominance. And, you know, is it a multipolar world, a bipolar world, a world in transition? Uh, but central to all of those things is this idea of China's economic dominance. Tell me a bit more about that and a bit about how that plays into sort of general geopolitical leadership. Absolutely. So the excuse, so to speak, about this uh, uh, this week uh, column is this this letter and um, uh, podcast is Xi Jinping's visit to Europe. The first in five years. Last time he went to Italy, uh, you might remember they signed a BRI memorandum uh, that caused a scandal in Washington. A G seven country signing up for. China's flagship policy of, let's say, uh, global economy, let's say, influence or, or domination, most likely. So, five years later, maybe we had COVID and whatever, Xi Jinping returns not to Italy because Meloni has uh, withdrawn uh, easily from the BRI, but to France uh, because Macron has been among the most vocal in Europe not being a vassal of the US in um, in saying that uh, if China intervenes in Taiwan, it's not in the EU strategic interest to intervene and this and that, you know, all music for Xi Jinping's ears. Come back to Europe, visit in Serbia for the commemoration of the bombing of the Chinese embassy by the Americans during the Kosovo war and then Hungary clearly um, paying tribute to Viktor Orban, the one that is really causing trouble to the EU, as you know. So, you know, trying to divide and conquer as usual. Uh, but this shows that, you know, China's influence is, is growing globally. Um, and actually, it's returning from an economic standpoint to uh, where it was traditionally. If you look at the calculations by Andrew Madison, uh, made for the IMF. China used to have about 25-30% of global GDP, let's say at the beginning of European times in year one, okay, whatever that means. Uh, of course, Chinese history goes back 3,000 more years. By these last 2,000 years, uh, China had that kind of global share of GDP, Collapsed to about five, six, ten percent max because of the rise of European countries and then, of course, of the US. And now it's coming towards the long term average. Considering that in PPP terms, which is in power parity uh, terms, China has already uh, surpassed the US 10 years ago. Um, so clearly, there's a, a, a rise of China economic. And then also geopolitically. And then the scholar of Harvard, uh, Graham Allison, wondered whether the US and China, US being the incumbent power, China, the rising power, will eventually end up um, in, in cl clashing in a hot war. But for the time being, uh, they are looking engaged in what we call Cold War. Um, and that's a practically the theme of the story. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the rise of China also though comes uh, alongside perhaps a parallel global shift, which is the decline of the United States. It's sort of intentional or unintentional move away from the helm of global leadership. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about that and where that came from, uh, but also how that's uh, kind of affecting and playing into the dynamic with China? Yes, absolutely. So. There's also a philosophical description of this phenomenon. Uh, Hegel, a German philosopher, uh, called Weltgeist, 
meaning that there's kind of a sort of world spirit that goes around. It actually started in China 5,000 years ago. Civilization effectively was born there. For many, many, many years, China was at the forefront of technological innovation. They had, for example, um, um, many instruments that in Europe only arrived thousands of years uh, later. Um, and then these wealth guys start moving around. First was uh, Mesopotamia. This is what we consider in our part of the world, the beginning of history, effectively. Then Egypt, and then eventually the Greeks and the Romans in ancient history. And then he continued to move around, move toward Northern Europe after the Baric invasions, the way they were called by the Romans. And then, you know, skipping two centuries, just getting closer to our time. The UK took from France and the Netherlands the Weltgeist and, and took it for a very long time. It built uh, the largest empire in human history, as we know. But then in 1917, they had money and they had to give a sort of torch to the US. And they kept it for 100 years. Um, but now, uh, it seems like uh, the US is ready to give it back from where this torch is coming from. So uh, the Chinese. Then there's also the sort of demographic uh, aspect. Uh, you know, we've discussed the economics, but there's the socio-political perspective into what is fueling uh, the rise of China, but also perhaps contributing to the decline of the West, uh, and more particularly the United States from the helm of global leadership. Tell me a bit more about that. So that's, that's the part that really scares me the most. When uh, uh, there's a rise in power, uh, it's kind of in an accelerating phase, right? In mathematical terms, we say, you know, the first and the second derivative of this growth function, let's call it that way, is, is positive, so it's accelerating. Uh, and then when they are peaking, the second derivative becomes negative. So there's growth, but it tends to be much more shallow. And then eventually also the first derivative inverse becomes negative, which means that the uh, country gets into decline. Now, China, even before getting this torch from the US, is already in this phase of somehow re relative decline because its population has somehow peaked, as we know, around one and a half uh, billion people. And, uh, and given the law of one child, effectively and other reasons um now population is destined to fall in coming decades so it's like the us is in relative decline because of the rise of china but also china is in relative decline so it's like the us passing its own witness uh to china which is already in declining phase. this has never actually happened in world history a declining power gave, gave somehow the wealth case to an accelerating power, which means that it was ready to take the world to a new dimension, you know, in terms of civilization development and so on. Um, but this is not the case, mm -hmm. which means that now we risk having a set of declining powers in China. Yes, India is rising and potentially of the China it would go back to India, as it was already a thousand years ago. Um, but it doesn't seem to be quite ready. Yes, demographically is expanding. Yes, economically is accelerating. Yes, manufacturing base is not there. Poverty is still way too much to make sure that it can get the sort of global leadership. Let's not even talk about the military and all the rest that is needed to project global power. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, the risk is that you start having a series of regional powers, including India, the US, and then China, and then all in the 
the European Union, perhaps, or some European countries, maybe Germany, knows Japan. But you start having a sort of series of regional powers, all in a relative decline or just um, rising, such as India not being big enough to influence uh, everything. And this is not a recipe for most, most people thought would be a sort of polycentric um, world uh, in which um, multipolarity would dominate and make sure that there's a sort of equilibrium and, uh, you know, somehow peace will eventually emerge. It's not the same. Um, a multipolar war is the one in which the occasion the conflict increased exponentially because the passage for, of the wellgeist in history has always been marked by conflicts. Uh, Graham Allison in his book uh, lists 16 episodes. In 12 of them, there was in fact a conflict between the rising power and the incumbent power. So, and this was only with two countries. Imagine when you have four or five or six. That's why I call it the era of chaos, is the era in which it's, it's unclear who dominates, it's unclear, unclear who set the rules. It would be probably a, a set of regional powers and spheres of influence that will eventually clash. This resembles a bit more like pre-World War I spheres of influence, tectonic plates that eventually clash and, and cause eruption earthquakes, which in historical terms are wars and conflicts. So uh, the risk is that we are really entering this space rather than anything else. Yeah. Um, and perhaps the second risk is, you know, rather than be in any moment where any one power is the hegemon for the entire world, we're rather in a world where uh, there's a number of regional uh, hegemons instead of a global hegemon, uh, a world that's polycentric, not sort of uh, unipolar or bipolar. Uh, and that's certainly kind of uh, the case when it comes to the fact that we're responding to what is very much a poly crisis you know, the sort of compounding of various global crises that affect the world in a multiplicity of ways. Uh, so certainly a much more complicated world for us political risk analysts to analyze. Uh, but as always, Brunello, thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you. Until next time.